Hello, good afternoon, IX and Bad Acidors. Meg here, Rachel is on a sales call right now, and so, oh, business development call right now. So she may be joining us here after a bit. Uh, so right now, you get me. Um, if anyone is uh, joined in, thank you for joining now. For those of you who will watch later, hello, thank you for joining. Um, Merry Christmas in advance, because uh, probably won't talk to you again before that. Uh, a few announcements. Let's see. IX uh, Leadership Live class in Rapid City, January 21st and 22nd. That um, is not quite full yet. So if you and a friend want to join in to that class, you should sign up immediately. Um, the, the link to sign up has been shared on this page. Um, it's on both of Rachel and I's individual Facebook pages, it's on LinkedIn, it's in all the places. So um, if you don't find it though in any of those places, let one of us know uh, and we'll make sure we get it to you. And um, let's see, what other things? Bob, is for anyone who didn't catch last week's, um, last week's live, uh, Bob Turnis is our new Chief Revenue Officer. He is in Boulder, Colorado, and started with us on 2 December. And so he has been working feverishly to build the business and get more people into the IX community. Uh, the book is available on Amazon, as you all well know. Thank you. Big shout out to uh, Shelly, Terry, Mark, and Jake who gave us reviews on Amazon, they get a uh, free invite to invite someone into the IX uh, closed group, um, or they can gift a book. So any of the rest of you, if you've read the book and you do a review on Amazon, we're keeping track of those, and then you get to uh, recommend someone or put someone into the IX uh, Facebook group, or you can have us send them a copy of the book. So don't forget to do that. Uh, the book is also available in Kindle version, which is now free holiday special. So um, anybody who you know who reads Kindle and they need some good material for the um, holiday break, recommend that. We're working on the audio version of the book that should be done soon. Um, it's a lot harder to read your own book out loud than one might think. Um, what other things do we need to tell you? Mm -hmm. Um, I can't think of anything else right at the moment, but I do see that Bob is on here. So Bob, if you think of anything, um, send me a message and I will make sure I say it. So today we're going to talk about being an entrepreneur and what does that mean and what does it feel like? And, um, then some of the questions, actually two of the questions, uh, got, the same amount of votes and, and one got the most, but we might actually talk about all three because they're all great questions. So first, in terms of entrepreneurship, um, let's tie that bad boy back to the four culture types. Now, a lot of times we see and a lot of times we hear, oh, well, all entrepreneurs are probably fixers or independents because they like the chaos and the freedom and, and they, they don't mind it being crazy. So yeah, a lot of times we do find that entrepreneurs are fixers or independents, but we've also found many times that a stabilizer or an organizer could be an entrepreneur. So let's talk through those four types. Uh, a fixer who prefers chaos in the team environment is probably going to you know, hire a team right away. Now, whether they're external to that business um, or you know, a bunch of resources, friends, family members who have done things that they, you know, in areas they need answers, um, or uh, if they actually hire a team within their business, um, but chances are that person cannot just work alone. They have to have someone around them so they can spitball ideas and be thinking about um, all the different ways that they can be successful. And they like a little bit of chaos and a little bit of freedom, um, and, and so they're really gonna be thinking about you know, innovation and, and strategy and how do they make all of that work together. An independent um, entrepreneur, of course, likes freedom, and then they're more on the self-driven side. And so 
they might not necessarily care too much about having a team, not that they don't care about their people, but they might not care too much about having the team. Um, but I will say an independent knows typically that they need a team, right? Um, and so they'll probably seek out advice uh, from some some trusted advisors when they first start, uh, just to make sure they're sort of on, on the right path. And then they'll just go for it, probably until they can afford or really need to start ramping up the employees and then they'll put some employees on their staff or you know, contract out whatever work needs to be done. Now, a stabilizer uh, entrepreneur is one gonna take a lot longer to decide they wanna be an entrepreneur, right? Because they prefer order and they, they're team driven. So they have a lot of things that they're probably thinking about. What does their family think about it? How is it gonna impact the people that they're working with currently? How can they make sure that they're providing a great environment for the people that they're going to hire into their new business? Uh, and so as a stabilizer entrepreneur starts to develop, to develop their thoughts and, and how the business is going to run, they're going to have sort of in that um, in the change cycle, their decline. So where they're going from, I have a job, I work for this person, to I have a new business. So in the decline where they're getting used to this new idea, they're really going to be intentional uh, about thinking about what's happening. Uh, once they start the business, they're for sure going to have a team and they're going to be constantly checking in with everyone on the team. Um, and they're going to want a lot of order. Now, a stabilizer entrepreneur might drive themselves a little crazy because they'll be checking to make sure that everything's okay and everyone's okay and that uh, things are going right. And uh, that can be a trap for that entrepreneur um, because they, they might really be um, kind of forsaking their own genius uh, to make sure everything's in order. So kind of the stepping over a dollar to pick up a dime mentality. Um, so then an organizer um, entrepreneur, and we actually, we had one of these, uh, and with an organization we worked with. And we, just in talking to this uh, CEO, we pegged the person as, a, as an independent. Uh, you know, I don't so much care about what everybody else thinks, not that I don't care about them or their ideas, but this is my idea, this is what I really wanna do. I know this is how it's gonna work because I've done this sort of thing before. Um, and, and didn't seem to mind the chaos, but then we did get some, like, you know, in hindsight, we got some of this, you know, like I'm always putting out agendas and no one's reading them, or I, I send out lists of things that need to be done and then they don't get done, you know, in the timeline that I've put out and I don't understand why. So they, we had the whole organization course uh, uh, management team, I guess, take the assessment, the culture type assessment, come to find out she's an organizer and was sort of driving her people a little bit crazy with all of her agendas and timelines and everything. Now, Full stop. I am not saying that agendas and timelines are not important. They're very important. Um, but if you know, it's all about how you manage them and how you manage communication and how you manage expectations of the team. And so an organizer entrepreneur uh, is going to be orderly and they they don't mind doing things by themselves. So they might put, you know, think, oh well, we need to do this thing, and then they'll put a whole agenda together or a project together and then dish it off to somebody else or a group of people and say, here's the thing we're doing. And the group's like, huh? Since when are we doing that? Or why are we doing that? Or can we get an explanation? Um, so an organizer entrepreneur has to make sure that they really are thinking um, and being intentional about communicating with their team. So those are kind of the differences in the four types of uh, entrepreneurial leadership styles. I don't think that, just kind of to loop back to that, everyone thinks that probably they would be a fixer and independent idea. Um, I don't think that there's any one, that any one culture type that would be better than another for entrepreneurship necessarily. Now, fixers and independents um, in a startup environment probably get through the daily grind a little bit, with a little bit more ease. 
uh, less anxiety because they don't so much mind the chaos and the freedom. But having said that, we've seen lots of these fixer and independent entrepreneurs and they sort of make their own madness because they're always like, oh, let's try this thing. Oh, okay, now let's go do this thing. And I'm working with this person. I'm doing this other thing. And their team, you know, and they could, maybe they're just like really, really fresh startup. They have a contractor working on their webpage. And that contractor, you know, is just like, I can't, I don't even know what you do yet. Like I, I can't even figure out what's happening right now. So uh, while fixers and independents as entrepreneurs may tolerate the speed with which entrepreneurship flies, um, stabilizers and organizers will organize that chaos uh, intentionally um, without letting the chaos rule them. And they might actually be better suited to that kind of environment if they can sort of pull on that, I have to accept and be ready for innovation and ready for things to change at the drop of a hat. So I'm looking at my notes. So what's it like to be an entrepreneur? Well, I'll give you, um, for those of you who aren't overly familiar with my story. So I was a HR manager at a gold mine in Western South Dakota. Before that, I had um, had an operations management role within transportation uh, for a trucking company, transportation industry, and then had done some time in, in hospitality and advertising. Um, always worked for the man, as it were, or the woman. Um, pretty much always had benefits, didn't have to worry too much about that. Um, paycheck was in, you know, direct deposit in my account. Uh, every two weeks wasn't always a big paycheck, but it was always a paycheck. So I didn't have to worry about that. Um, had retirement benefits for most of my career. So putting money towards that, didn't have to worry about that. And uh, all that was great, really great. Um, but ever since I was in college, probably before that, but for sure when I was in college, I knew that I wanted to work for myself. Um, due in part to my zany crazy personality and not wanting someone else to boss me around but also just because i knew that i was like intended for greatness and making some big impact in the world and the only way i was really going to get to do that is if i made sure i did it myself fixer mm. so uh when i was working at the gold mine and rachel and i started talking about developing um well what is now ix leadership i thought geez, I got two little kids depending on me and you know, I got a mortgage payment, a car payment. And can I really, is that a thing? Can I really do this? Um, and what I discovered really, really quickly about becoming an entrepreneur, the very first thing you should know is no matter what culture type you are, you have to do a lot of mindset work. If you're coming out of a corporate environment or, you know, working for someone else, no, no matter if you're a corporation or not, you really have to do a lot of work around, um, you know, what it means to work for yourself in terms of, you know, designing your own schedule and knowing when you're going to take time off and when you're not. I think a lot of people think that uh, when you work for yourself, especially in consult, especially if you're consulting, when you work for yourself, you can set your own hours and whatever. Well, you can. Um, and if you're good at it, what ends up happening is you don't set any hours for off. So you have to be, you know, thinking about what kind of schedule you're going to work and how is that going to work. Um, and then you, you start thinking a little bit differently about money and how it comes in the door, how you think about um, what money means and how, and I, I, you know, in 45 minutes, I cannot uh, express to you how deeply important all of this stuff is. Um, so I'm, I'm really just touching on the, the basics, but money mindset, time mindset, um, goals. So this is an interesting thing and I won't foray, foray into this too much because next week we'll talk about it a bit. Um, but I think, you know, when you're in a corporate environment or in an office environment, you don't spend a lot of time talking about intentional goal setting. So of course, most organizations, especially large ones, have goals, right? They have a strategy in place and it's like 5% cost reduction over the current or the last year and 
you know, uh, increased efficiency by a certain percentage or increased net revenue, whatever. But that doesn't really mean anything to anyone, which is why Rachel and I started doing what we were doing in the first place. So but when you come and become an entrepreneur and you, you start thinking about all these grandiose things that you want to do, it's really overwhelming. And so you have to cut that back and do some backwards math into, um, you know, what does that mean? So if I want to make so much money a year, then how many hours does that mean I work? And what is my billable hourly rate? Thank you, Bob, for making Rachel and I pin that down. Um, and, and, you know, how much would I work for a day? And, and what if, you know, what if there was a nonprofit organization that I really had a, a spot in my heart for and would I work for them for free or would I work for them uh, for less than my daily rate or hourly rate? Uh, so you really, you really have to start thinking about um, all of that mindset work and, and how you're going to spend your time and what you're going to spend your time on. Uh, let's see, what's the next thing? So the other really important lesson um, that Rachel and I learned, and, and thankfully for us, we didn't learn it by failure. And I think because we both had had lots of experience in a, in a corporate setting, um, we knew what our limits were uh, and not the limits of the business, because let me tell you, there is no top end to Rose Group International. We are going to take over the world. Um, but limits in terms of, uh, I don't do website building. Now, Rachel can do website building, um, but that's not what we pay her hourly rate for, is for her to sit on the computer and do website building. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that she doesn't. When we first started, you know, and it was just she and I, and um, she was already an entrepreneur working on her own. And so we were both investing extra time and extra money into getting this thing up and running. And so we saved money wherever we could. So Rachel could do website building. Uh, she enjoys doing it, mostly. Uh, not when she's in a hurry and trying to do other things. <laughs> but um, so she would do website building uh, until finally one day I sort of like pried it from her cold, dead, she wasn't dead, cold hands and said, listen, you're not doing that anymore. You know, we, we, we pay you a lot of money to be working on making us money, not on spending money um, or not spending your time wisely rather. And so that I think is a big lesson in entrepreneurship. When you first get started, uh, it certainly pays you back to do the things you can do yourself. But realize that point in time when you have the, the money or the resources to have someone else do those things. And a little tip to help you with that. You know, when do you actually know when that's going to happen? Because Rachel could actually do our website building forever. And it, and we might just say, well, that's worth the, the money that we spend for her hours on that because we know it's right and she knows she's comfortable with it and likes to do it. But um, how, so, so then how do you know when it actually makes sense uh, to kind of call in another person? Well, I would, what you do is, Figure out, you know, like I said, back, back, do the backwards math back into what's your hourly rate and how much are you paying yourself versus how much would you pay someone else to do it. So we'll just keep going with the website building example. So if you're going to pay someone else to build your website, you're going to pay them a thousand dollars up front and then you're going to pay them a hundred dollars a month to make sure it's updated. Uh, is that worth your time? So that's basically you know, well, it depends on what your rate is, but that that's a lot of your time freed up to do the things that you're trying to do. And so you have to be intentional with that tool in, okay, I have to be ready to spend this money somewhere else. Um, so someone else can do this thing for me and then I can go do this other thing that's not happening. We as entrepreneurs fall into this trap of, well, I can just do it all. And, uh, what we kind of forget when we say, well, I can just do it all is there's actually all, all these other things that we are not focusing on. We, you know, we are not uh, building our sales funnel. Hi, sorry, I'm late. 
you know, we're not building our sales funnel and, and making sure we've got new clients in our pipeline or um, we're not paying attention to getting the book done in our case. And so when you, when you think that, oh gosh, I have to do these things because no one else is going to do them, that may be true, but at what point do you say someone else can do these things? I can hire a consultant to do it um, or a part-time person or an intern. Gosh, there's tons of interns around here that work for free. Um, get what you pay for, so be careful with that. But uh, when do you when do you stop doing the things that are not your specialty and not making you money so that you can do the things that do make you money? Um, and that's why sort of doing that backwards math into what your hourly rate is and figuring up how much you're spending on the thing that isn't isn't making you money that helps you make that decision um, and it's kind of a gut feel and you know you kind of just know um, and, and as the new business rolls in you, you know you start just like with the with the website stuff we started getting really busy and developing all, all, all these proposals and working on the book and said to Rachel man you got to stop working on that website like somebody else is going to do that we I've been using the website example oh, okay uh, as a uh, move it off the plate what not to do yeah <laughs> well i did say you have to do it until you don't have to do it anymore. right yeah. Yeah. yeah um so that's that's sort of a that's the bit about know your limits again don't ever put limits on the top side of success uh you can if the and really we tell people the, the crazier and hairier and bigger the goal is um the more successful you'll be so if you ask the universe for a hundred thousand dollars, you might get fifty. So why not ask it for a million? Because then you get five hundred thousand. That's way better than fifty thousand. Um, so I have a couple other things on here, and then you can start talking about your perspective on entrepreneurship. Okay, I will. Um, the next guy's here. I'm going to see if he needs a sign. Okay. Yeah, he's waiting. So the other thing that I think is important to think about is oh, oh, okay. the wrong place. This Poor guy. Amazing. Make sure you thank your FedEx and UPS people this time of year. Holy buckets. Right. Um, never stop hustling. And and the the lesson in that, I mean, that seems like it goes without saying because of all of the, the hype around how being working for yourself is so hard. But what I mean when I say never stop hustling is don't ever give give up on what you intended to do. So our goal when we started was to impact the lives of people and change the way business is done and make money doing it. And so we don't ever, I mean, not a day goes by where Rachel and I, if we talk, like unless it's a holiday or something, but we usually talk then too. We try not to talk about business all the time. But most of the time, it's about business, and we don't ever let a day go by. And this isn't even intentional. We've sort of just built it into the dynamics of our business. But there isn't a day that goes by that we don't talk about, you know, does that really serve our goal, our goal of helping people, changing the world, um, changing the way business is done and making money. And if it doesn't, you know, if it really doesn't positively impact um, or have some sort of ancillary benefit to those areas, it's off the table. And so um, always be intentional about following through on your strategy and your goals. That's what I mean by hustling. I don't mean uh, sit down and work on your Excel spreadsheet budget for 17 hours because you're a really great accountant. Uh, no. Uh, I don't mean work on websites because you're really great at IT, your website building and creative design. Uh, what I mean is hustle your business not don't let your business hustle you i think that's my uh, that's oh my look at that that sounds like a meme it sounds like a meme. brb and building my empire brb um and the last thing i would say about entrepreneurship is because you're hustling your business and sort of living your dream and let me just say do not start a business that isn't your dream like don't so become and, and i <laughs> And I'm I am definitely speaking from um, a place of experience. I have like ten business uh, business ideas with the what's the thing called the um, 
when you start a business and you have to have the whole thing. The show the bank. Yeah, thanks. Pro forma. Jesus. Uh, I have like 10 different business plans that I've put together, you know, like a cleaning business, which by the way, if any of you want to start a cleaning business in Spearfish, but don't want to be the cleaning person, I have the entire business plan built out or anywhere for that matter. You don't right. have to be in Spearfish. But I've built out tons of business plans. And I call my girlfriend, my uh, Katie Gallagher, who, oh, Kaufman, sorry, Mary, uh, best friend from college. I'm like, hey, guess what? I'm going to do this thing. And she's like, that's ridiculous. Like, you, you're not going to do that. That, like, that doesn't suit you. You're not going to be happy doing that. So really, man, check, gut check your ideas. Don't be an entrepreneur for being an entrepreneur's sake. Figure out what it is you can be passionate about because it's a different kind of work. You have to love what you're doing every day. There is no greater value statement or goals or strategy or bonus that you're working for other than your own. And so if you can't be in love with what you're doing every day, you're screwed because we're not swearing. On That's right. I've been thinking about making notes over here. I'm trying not to use personally. Yeah. Notes. Um, so uh, it's a different kind of work and be ready for that is it's um the, the funny thing about being an entrepreneur is it's as much gratifying every day it's 10 times more gratifying than working for someone else it's 10 times as much heartache <laughs> when things don't go right than when you're working for someone else and you have to you have to be ready for that and that goes back to that mindset of you know you just every day you're working on and thinking about how you can improve and, and meet your goals. Um, and the last thing I would say about that different kind of work is uh, make sure you give yourself a little time off because you're literally emotionally, physically, mentally giving your entire self to that, that new endeavor because you can't let it fail. And, um, we really think that we can do that and, and, and then of course until you can't and so be sure to give yourself some time to reflect on what's going on and just breathe go for a hike sit down read a book take a nap go on vacation whatever it is but don't be working all of the time at least that's been my experience <laughs> <laughs> and now rachel um, here, just so you... I'm just going to look at her list to make sure I don't say the same shit. Same stuff. Um, it's a month in here. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, so you've already talked about types. I did. I started okay. with that, yeah. For the okay. types of terms. Sure, you've got to have to look at this. Yeah. Okay, well, um, sorry I'm late to the game. I was on a... Did you tell me where I was? Yep, I did. Yeah. Anyway, I was on a sales call with a, a new firm that we're going to be working with, and um, they are... It's fascinating because um, our culture types work. Work. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna make one concession for swearing because this is what we say all the time. This shit really works. works. Yeah, works. It really works. <laughs> so I'm. Yeah, I was talking to a. Um, excuse me for the sidebar. Yes. Share. Um, there's a CEO who's like, Go. they have literally this company's grown twenty percent every year. And so when I when I'm talking to him, I'm, I was like, okay, you guys had a lot of growth. Your thing is going to be a big company now. Blah, blah, blah. He's like, you keep saying that uh, we're not growing fast enough. There, I, no matter what we do, we're not growing fast enough. Yeah, we've made twenty five million dollars this year, but that is not enough. I wanted to make whatever, and then he is just like, go, go, go. And I could just feel everyone else in the room doing this, <sighs> right? Because he's the fixer slash independent, probably independent, because he's not caring really what all of this craziness the effect it's having on those new people he's just like that idea again and frankly no one is willing to like stand up to him or challenge him or like listen rich here's the deal you know <laughs> and so anyway fascinating it works anyway um so entrepreneurship one of the things that is really really important about entrepreneurship is that you are who you hang out with and that's true in life and it's true in business so if you are hanging out with a group of people that you really like and they ride their uh, mountain bikes 50 miles every weekend, guess what? You're probably going to ride your bike 50 miles every weekend because that's what they do for fun and you don't want to miss out on their fun and that's what your friends are. Um, if you hang out with five millionaires, uh, guess what? You're going to be the sixth millionaire because you learn from them, you value what they value, you grow together. And so 
uh, absolutely, it's really, in some ways, it's really hard um, to want to be ambitious and grow in a place that it, maybe your current existing matrix of humans doesn't understand that, doesn't get it, doesn't understand who they are. And so that's can be really hard. Um, and, you know, it's one of the reasons that that we are, are involved in some of these nationwide um, uh, networking groups like uh, the Hero Club. You'll see us post on the Hero Club, Six Week Network, Thought Council, like a bunch of them. Because that that makes us grow and that makes us grow into new things. And we're always seeking to be with people that have figured out the game, right? I mean, and that is the true secret of entrepreneurship is business is a game. And I do, we just are learning how to play it better. And the, every day that goes by, we're learning more and more how to play it better. And, um, and so when you get started, it's like anything. If you wanted to be an Olympic tennis player, you're, you can't go from not holding a racket to the Olympics. Like, you got to put the time in. And so I can tell you, I've been doing this for five years, and, um, and I am vastly smarter, wiser, um, understand more, play the game better than I did when I first started. And if you're into it for just working for yourself, it's a much um, shallower curve, right? It's a, if you just want to be a so what we call a solopreneur, so working for yourself by yourself, you can make plenty of money by yourself doing that. The, the challenge, it gets a lot more complicated when, like Meg and I, we want to actually change the world. That's not hyperbole. That's like legit. And we actually want to change how people think about their employees. And that, and that means a big team, a bigger reach, a global reach, uh, understanding how to be present on social media, all of the things. Those are all tools to do that. So um, you, it's, it's, there's a learning curve. And so have patience. I love Meg's advice when I first came in about focus on the things that can make you money because make the money first as you figure out all the other stuff and then add complexity as you go. But you got to actually be able to pay your mortgage first. And eventually you'll get out of that phase where, oh, shit, can I, oh, sorry, oh, can I pay my mortgage this month to, oh, well, now I can actually pay my mortgage and hire the web person, right? So it takes some time. But, it, but so just have patience. Too. Um, and one of the things that Meg said at the end where we were sort of eyeballing each other was that there's no right way to do it. I mean, you have to be passionate, you have to work your butt off, all the things. However... Meg and I have totally different work styles. For me, if I'm sitting on my couch at night at six o'clock and I think of something, I'll pull my laptop out and work. And and I'll be up at 2 a.m. And Meg's like, what are you doing up at 2 a.m. doing the things, doing the web page? You are insane. What are you doing? What are you doing? And so, and Meg is much more about, hey, I want to accomplish this amount of work. When I have that accomplished, then that's my day. And that's totally fine. It's a totally different way to do it. And I think that's, uh, and so don't, you know, there's some, a lot of self-awareness about being an entrepreneur, right? And so you really have to start, Meg was talking about gut checking and stuff. The other thing is, what do you prefer? Frankly, culture types can help a lot with that. Um, her and I, we don't want the everyday same thing. We love that every day is completely different. If you, just because you're a stabilizer or an organizer doesn't mean you can't be an entrepreneur. You're just going to be a different kind of entrepreneur than so if you see our insanity and you say, uh, I'm clearly not going to be an entrepreneur. I'm that's not me. like those crazy people. Well, that's probably fine. First of all, that's okay. We love you because. But, um, but it, it also doesn't have to be that way. We have very good friends or passionate entrepreneurs that are stabilizers. Well, I guess it's Chris an organizer? Rob Boy? Or is he a stabilizer? He's an organizer. He's an organizer. He, likes, he loves order. In fact, his, uh, you know, sort of, counterparts, partners are chaotic and that drives, you can't even walk in their office without getting hives, you know? And so um, there is no right way to do it. So um, believe in your way and that it's going to work. Um, so the good news is about the entrepreneurship is you never have to work for a jerk again. Now, you'll have clients, you might be a jerk, but, um, <laughs> but you, you know, my frustration when I was working for people is that um, I was a high performer. Or I was willing, I'm a fixer, I'm willing to do whatever. Just tell me the problem, I'll go figure it out. Well, because of that, then I would get the craftiest jobs, right? Or I would get the stuff that no one else would do. Oh, Rachel will do it, she's up for whatever. 
And over time, that makes me really resentful because I really want to do the complicated hard things, not just the things that no one else wants. And so that's one of the things that I love about being my own boss is that I never have to do that again. Now, it doesn't mean that I'll never do things I don't want to do. I don't really want to do work that you do. I really don't. Uh, and those kinds of things. It's not that you'll never have to do work that you don't want to, but you get to choose it. And that very act of choosing is incredibly empowering. And um, there's nothing like it. So, um, you know, me, like, getting in this uh, this match that I just came out of, it was very challenging. Like, he's, he's very in your face. And I had to, like, step up to that. And that's really not my style. But um, so, you know, it's not that I wasn't, that I didn't feel awkward. But it was, I was there because I, I chose to be there and I wanted to do it. So that makes, it makes a difference. Um, let's see. Oh, and, and then at the end, one of the questions, and I assume this is part of it. Yeah, it is a thing. Um, what, yeah, that was the winners. That was the winner. The resource question. Oh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. Was, I told them we would talk about these three because these two got equal and it wasn't too much less than that. Okay. Not too many less votes. So. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so one of the things that, um, when you bring people into your space, um, it becomes, uh, your it's your space and it's uh it's the way that you make a living it's your reputation it's your brand it's everything about you so your company is you it might not be your face but it is who you are and so uh, be very careful who you invite in uh, like meg was saying you know have the website person have the people that are helping you get your job done but make sure that you're vetting those people that you understand don't just we see huge errors all the time where somebody hires his college roommate or his wife's brother or whatever, and they're not gonna, and that doesn't work out. And so what we'd love to do, and this is kind of a fun tip for you guys, is when we have an opportunity to bring in someone to the team, whether it's Michelle or Laura or Kelsey, frankly, as the two people that we interface with the most, um, we talk to their people, or well, Meg knew Kelsey personally, so that's a little different, but, and knew that she was good. Um, Michelle and Laura, they both went to the university in our little town. And so we talked to their professor, basically. Like for when I found Laura, our graphic designer, I went to the university and I said, hey, graphic designer faculty member, um, who has been a really great uh, you know, student? Who do you think would be make a good employee? And so I talked to them and made sure that before I ever called Laura or reached out to her, that I knew who she was and what she was about. Michelle's the same way. Um, Michelle's a writer. She's like, I talked to her former advisor or the, the, the dean of the liberal arts college of which she was a part of. And so we, we don't just invite, don't, be careful who you invite in. So don't, don't give the work to your you know, neighbor because they're out of work and they need some work. That's very nice of you. It's very generous. And they probably really value that. But they are, uh, once they're in your world, they're representing you in your organization, your company, your, what you're trying to do. And you just really want to make sure that they're aligned with your vision and they understand what you need and how to how to do that. So I guess that would be my one sort of trick that um, that we do um, when we hire somebody or bring somebody to our space. And Bob, I've known for 15 years, so that's a little bit okay. Of course. I'm so that, Rachel makes a really great point. And a lot of times in recruitment, especially in, in bigger organizations, you'll hear... Um, hire for attitude, train for performance. And that is true. That's where that gut check comes in. Whoever you're bringing in, make sure you can get on with them, really. Because if you can't, uh, you have to fire them. And you're like, who wants to do that? No one. And you don't have to do it because you now own your own business and you can actually take a little bit of time, think about who you want to be associating with um, and, and how that's all going to work. Now, I would say, though, the difference between being an entrepreneur um, and being in a large organization uh, on that bit about uh, train for performance uh, or train for skill set. Yes, that's true. But you better make sure that that person has the chops that you need them to have to go do that job that you need them to do. Mm -hmm. And that's important in an organization, but an organization has other people that can kind of assume some responsibilities while this person gets trained and, and sort of up to speed on what the company expectations and culture are. When you're working for yourself, the reason you're getting rid of that 
website building or, you know, bookkeeping or whatever it is, is because you do not have time to do it. So then you do not have time to train that person how to do that job. Now, yeah, you're going to have to sit down with them for half a day or a day or a couple times or whatever till they kind of get a feel for what the hell you're doing, the heck you're doing. Um, but after that, they need to be able to go do their own thing. And so Bob is an example. You know, Rachel and I had tons of conversations about, okay, Bob knows sales, Bob knows business development, Can he? and he knows our space in terms of um, – uh, creating buy-in and in, in a leadership team and, and helping people understand why a cohesive culture is important. Um, but even though he knows all those things, like, is he the right guy? Does he fit with our team? Can he go do the things we need him to do um, so that we are not babysitting him and tailing him up? Because that the, he's hiring him is the very reason that we need him. Um, so you can hire someone who maybe doesn't have exactly the skill set you need, but Kind of to Rachel's point about hiring the neighbor's kid, like don't kid yourself into, well, this will probably work for now because they'll only do it for $10. And like I said earlier, interns are great, but you're getting what you pay for sometimes. So just be really careful about who you're aligning your business with because you're entrusting your own livelihood into someone else's hands. Yeah, such a big deal. And, and um, also be aware of the space you want to work in. Uh, like one of the one of the b big benefits to, of Bob's experience, even though he's never done leadership or that kind of stuff specifically, is that he works in corporate, and that's where we work. That's the space we work in. So he understands that space. Um, yeah, I had another thought that just escaped me. Mm -hmm. Put it away. Mm -hmm. I can think for a minute. Go ahead. Something else. Okay. Um, <laughs> Some, what were you talking about? Something um, else. I was talking people, about hiring the intern, paying ten dollars to the neighbor's yeah, kid. Yeah, there was something about that. Um, don't kid yourself that they're going to do the job you need them to do. do. Yeah, you can train them. for skills, but you they've been no, 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 no. That was something about that at the end there. The ten dollars, ten dollars, and you know, yeah, you get what you pay for. Sort of thing. I don't know. I don't remember what you were thinking. I know. It would be really helpful. We share a brain a lot, but I just really don't. Remember. Got distracted by the thing. Well, we should answer this question. So, what's the other question? Okay, so, uh, okay. Well, how no. do you take the first terrifying step? Well, just F and do it. Like that, I don't know that there's any better way to well, say it. I, I mean, I think there are better ways. So, there are better ways, but the reality, we'll give you some, we'll, Rachel will give you some sage advice. But my I'll sage advice sage is advice. just F and do it. That's because I'm a fixer. Go on. Well, and that's not really true. She's lying. Because what happened before you really stepped away from your job full time? Yeah, well, lots of things. But I had to, I guess when I say it, what I mean is you have to decide in your head and your heart, like, that you're just going to do it. You yes, can't just be like, critical. well, maybe I will, well, maybe I won't. In your head, you have to just do it. And then there's like 100 million things that you physically have to do and mindset work you have to do before you not feel like you don't need to be put in a straight jacket and locked up in the nut house. That'd be bad. Um, but really what you can do is you can start small. So um, I started small, Meg started small, not small in the ambition, but small in the commit financial commitment, I would say. And so what a lot of us do, a lot of people that are already professionals, um, or maybe even if you're not a professional just working an hourly job, but you want to start something, is you, we started all of us, or at least both of us. We started um, as part as a part-time gig. You know, we kept our full-time jobs. We looked at okay, what do we have to do? What does this look like? We set up our business. We thought about what we wanted to do, who our clients might be, what we were going to do, what change we we're going to affect in the world, and all that stuff. We talked about all that while having our job. And then at some point, when we felt like, okay, I have, I'm not completely destitute. Uh, you know, I have a little, I, ha I feel like if I step off this cliff, I'm not going to go immediately into poverty, right? Um, then I think that's what we needed. Now, we were mid-career. Meg was, Meg's 30, 40, 33, 30, yeah, 33. Um, I'm 44, but I was in my 30s when I started. And so... We, we were mid-career, so we had kids already. We had all of the things. And so we felt like, like I had a house. 
Um, I was pretty stable. Meg has, you know, has a house, pretty stable, has a car that works well, all things. Like we know what we need, how much money we need to make to make all of those things work well. That doesn't mean they have to, we are going to have a, a jet, but it does mean that I need, in my example, I always thought I need $3,000 a month to pay for bare minimum. That's house payment, car payment, kids stuff, food, whatever, electric bill. Now that's bare minimum I can squeeze by. And I've lived poor a lot of my life, so I feel like I cannot spend money besides what I need to. If you're not good with money, get help with that first. But anyway, <laughs> but of course, once, so that was my absolute minimum goal. And then it, like Meg was saying earlier, I never shot for 3000 a month because that meant if I didn't quite get there, I would be in trouble. So I was always shooting for bigger numbers than that. And I never had trouble getting those bigger numbers because once you decide that's what you're going to do and you start doing it, then that's, you make decisions to make that happen. But I think you have to, I think if you go into it feeling like you're going to throw up because you don't have any money in the bank, that's not going to help you because that's not going to free up enough of your energy to focus on the job. Um, now you might still feel like you're going to throw up later. That's happened. Like there are moments where you're like, Oh my God, I'm never going to make it. How am I going to make it? Um, that's the innovation phase. Check out chapter uh, part two of the book for more about that. So you'll have those big swings, right? You'll have the days that you're like, we're going to be millionaires. And then the next day you're like, Oh my God, I can't even make my mortgage. This month. Which we never did for the record. We have never not been able to pull shit off. That was pulled that off financially. Um, so believe that you can do it because you can. Um, but I, I, you know, it's, it would be hard for me and we're fixers. We like chaos. And it's even hard for us to think about making that jump feeling like we, that we're not, we don't have some level of financial cushion. So anyway, just, uh, so if you're thinking about you wanting to do it, Meg wanted to be an entrepreneur for her whole freaking life. And then she finally actually did it when she got to a place in her life where she felt like she could financially do okay and not wreck her family, right? So you have to be smart about it. We want you to be idealistic and passionate and all of that, but you also, you know, have to pay your rent. So, or live with your parents, which is okay. If you want to look like, that'd be awesome. It's not be okay with me. It would be totally okay with me. My parents are amazing. My parents are amazing. Yeah, I'm fucking with my parents. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so because we have not too much time left, yeah, we're, we're sort of, of over okay. time. But the real question today was, what resources have you relied on for the support you, you'd usually get as an employee, i.e. scheduling, conferencing, even taxes? Oh, that's what I was going to say. I remember it. That reminded me. Um, when you can and when it's appropriate, you should invest in your own training. Because there's things like we are running into things with clients that started small and grew big because they don't have just simple processes in place. They don't know how to run a project. They don't know how to think about finances. They don't know how to, you're not going to be an expert in everything, but you have to have some knowledge about most things. And so, you know, if there's a, a one day class that you can take or, or a week long class somewhere that will, you feel like will really pull the barriers down. I did a, a three month class about how do I take my knowledge and create programs out of it or consulting packages. I had no freaking idea how to do that. I had a ton of knowledge, but I didn't know how to sell it or put it or package it in a way that would be sellable. So I invested, I don't know, I think two grand into um, my, into a training that taught me how to do that. Cause I believe that after that training, I'd be able to go sell that $2,000 very quickly. And so, um, when you feel that, like that, you, that you're self-limiting, like Meg was saying, you know, when you, when there's something preventing you from achieving that revenue goal, and it's probably your own knowledge, um, go get some training. Go, I mean, SDCEO has training. Meg's doing training in January. Um, you know, SDCEO, that's our local sort of small business office. They have like one day entrepreneur boot camps and stuff. So they can really think little things like that. Online training can really help you. Uh, there's a ton of stuff online that you can do. So depends on what kind of business you want to do and what you want to what you want to develop. But that'd be my biggest piece of advice. Yeah. Uh, resources that we use. So we both use a scheduling tool. Um, I I use the free version. Rachel's is paid. Frankly, I don't. I'm not. I don't know what the difference is. Um, but it's you can book me. I think it's like you can book dot me. Anyway, that's super simple to set up, and it will. Um, it will map over. You can map it into your own current schedule. So if you use Gmail or Calendar, Outlook yeah. or whatever, 
um, you can map it over into your own calendar and then it'll just drag all of your uh, uh, commitments that you already have into it. And then you just send that link out when people want to book you, uh, book some time with you, and then they click on it, set up the time, and it just automatically goes into your calendar. Um, we use the Gmail um, interface and we ghosted our our email addresses, so at Rose Group INTL into Gmail accounts with some magic that Rachel knows. It's called G Suite. It's oh, not yeah. Not very much money, but it basically lets us have an actual email instead of having Meg Rose Group at Gmail, which is clearly an amateur stunt, right? I mean, you do that until you get big enough. But once you want, once you have a reputation for being a professional, you don't want a Gmail account. You want an actual grown up account. And so that's one way to do it. All right, so G Suite is what you use for that. Um, what else? Uh, we have a bookkeeper that handles um, tax stuff. Uh, she's going to be handling. She's handling a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. That was one of those things where you know, I mean, Rachel writes the checks every week out of the bank account. That you know, we pay the bills we need to until we can hand everything over to the bookkeeper. So we've kept some of that in house, um, but the stuff that like you really don't want to goof up, give to someone who takes care of that thing, those things for a living. Um, IRS. Give the IRS stuff. Yeah, you don't want to, you want to get sideways with that stuff. What other resources do we use that are handy? Um, let's see. I, I have used, in terms of like invoicing and keeping track of clients, I've used a, it's called the Wave, Wave app. Um, it's a website. Uh, anyway, it's free. It's pretty handy. It's got some paid stuff too, you know, where there's paid resources that so. you don't have to use those. A click funnel, that's a resource that we've kind of recently discovered. Um, mm -hmm. That one is super handy for building out um, a, basically a quick link with all the information for a specific uh, product that you want to sell. Uh, the, the things that are probably the best resources in terms of advertising are Facebook, Social media. And LinkedIn, Twitter, um, Instagram, which I don't really do much of. Well, let's be real. I don't do much of any of it, but we pay Just other people so that Meg's stuff gets posted. Um, a couple of things, one, uh, one way that we've gotten paid by clients, which is handy, is people, it depends on what you do, if you're doing coaching or a service or something. For individuals, we've actually had a lot of individuals pay us through like PayPal, um, cat, cat, what's called cash app. I was just going to put this up here so you can see it. The cash there. The cash app. Yep. Thank you. There it is. But it's now it's, hold on. There we go. Cash app. There's Zelle, which is also another one. Um, and so those are ones that are great. Um, yeah. Bob is saying Salesforce <laughs> for small business. So he's being, he's really helping us be much more formal about tracking clients through Salesforce and we love him for it, thank you, Bob. Um, but he's, we're doing a Salesforce for small business is basically a, um, Salesforce is, can be rolled out to huge corporations, right? But they have a small business version. Um, what else do we do pretty regular? Um, I tell you a shared calendar saves us because then we know where everyone's at all the time. Yeah, and sure. that's our C-suite, that's our G-suite. Uh, calendar. We're looking at our apps to see what we're what we use all the time. Bob is there. Oh, Bob uses um, we use Hangouts, Google Hangouts, because Bob is whatever. Bob oh. is in Boulder and we're in Spearfish, and so yeah. we use Google Hangouts all the time, uh, which is handy and really well uh, accepted by those of us who are smart enough to have Androids. The rest of you, poor souls, have to deal with it. But it. I, Rachel's rolling her eyes, but it is actually been pretty handy with it Bob because then it's not like it doesn't, it's not like you're getting a text message every 15 minutes or somebody's calling you and leaving messages or 100 emails in your inbox. It's basically a live chat. And so as Bob is learning more about the organization and blah, 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 all the things, he can just send quick notes back and forth about stuff. Um, it's also great as a back channel while you're on an opportunity call, a sales call. Pay attention to the call. Don't be on the computer. Um, the, um, another thing that we could not live without is Zoom. Um, some of you might know Zoom. Some of you might not know. Corporate doesn't use Zoom very much. Um, so if you're in that kind of space. But Zoom is basically a, I think it's free. 
you have free. Like if you have it for free, you get like half hour. Yeah, forty five minutes. Forty five minute session um, for free. And so Zoom is a video conferencing software. It's brilliant. It's super efficient. Um, a lot of uh, corporations use Skype, and Skype is a little more kludgy. I'm on a Mac, and so Skypes are a nightmare. Um, so the nice thing about Zoom is it's platform independent. It doesn't matter what you have. It's really great on your phone, on your PC, on your Mac. So um, that part is essential uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna um, be on your own. Um, a couple of other not so much business related, but a very important apps that I use. Um, download Solitaire because if you travel a lot, you don't use you don't need the internet. You don't need Wi-Fi. So um, on a plane, it's a lifesaver. Yeah. So the other one that I um, that I use a lot is the Netflix. If you have a Netflix account, then you can download the movies or whatever while you're at home, and then you can watch them while you're traveling. Um, if you're a movie watcher, I'm not much one, but I do use that app once in a while. Um, another thing that we do a lot when we travel is use Airbnb and VRBO to find a place to stay because it will save you. 75% over staying in a hotel when there's especially when there's a lot of you or two or three of you yeah and so and you, then the thing that we really like about it is that then you can have your own space and you have a kitchen and mm -hmm. you That's can nice. stop at a local uh, grocery store or corner store and pick up whatever a loaf of bread some water some cheese and then when you get home at night home at night it feels like you're home at night Right, it's a little less stressful. A couple, another travel app that I couldn't live without is called Hotel Tonight. Um, that one is like when we when I when we go to New York City and we need a hotel room. If I actually book same day, I can save like fifty percent on any hotel room. Uh, hotels in New York with taxes and everything, five hundred dollars is about as cheap as you're going to find, and I can literally get a hotel room for probably two fifty um, if I book same day. And because it's New York City, there's always a room available. So um, it's a little risky, and but you know my fixerness is okay with the risk. Um, I guess one last thing I'll share is that we do, um, you know, we're in front of a lot of groups where there's a lot of cameras and stuff, and I like uh, rent the runway. So when I'm in, when I'm in a networking event, the same like I like to wear a nice thing. Well, I have like three nice things. So after a couple of meetings, everyone has already seen my nicest dress. You know. So what I do is I'm, uh, I do rent the runway, which means I can borrow clothes, um, and I have an account. So I get clothes delivered to my house. I send clothes back via UPS store, and it just shows up. And so it's great. If you want to try it, I can. I have like free trials I can share with friends. So um, sorry, men in the room, I don't think they have one for you, but um, the, for the ladies, we can. Um, I can give you a trial for free thirty days or something on that. So. Oh, you know what else is way worth having is um, uh, get TSA pre-check one. Oh, yeah. Like, if, I don't know why people, it's $180 for oh, it's not even that five much. years yeah, or 10 years. It it's stupidly cheap. I don't know why. I mean, for the limited amount of traveling that I used to do, now that I travel a lot, I'm like, I don't know why I didn't get this before. Especially if you have a family. I know that's not business related, but if you have a family... Dude, so much easier. Like, there is no taking off of the shoes or get your iPad out of your bag that you somehow buried in the bottom, even though I told you to put it in the top, like, pre-check. Also, clear is another one. Now, that's only in 10-ish. The, the, big, the big airports. Yeah. Like JFK, LAX, probably Denver, probably Minneapolis. Yeah. But that one, you can actually even skip basically the whole pre-check line. It's incredible. They biometrically scan you and then they literally walk you past the line and right to the belt basically yeah be ready Radical. for some dirty looks <laughs> in that i don't care it's I'm also over it. over the dirty looks. yeah it's we get that as a benefit for being hero club members but it's also um it's not that much like 20 bucks a month if you yeah use it's, it. it's, it's awesome. not a terrible amount so anyway Okay, we have like we are... we're way over one little th oh it's an hour sorry one little thing that i pay for personally um, that I don't have the company pay for is I'm a member of the Delta Sky Club. And that sounds really snotty and I hate even that I'm doing it sometimes. But basically it's, you know, you get, um, you can walk in, there's always food, there's always drinks. You know, airport, if you hang out for two hours in an airport, you're going to spend 50 bucks on food and drink probably. And a book and all the other things, food and board. 
Um, it has great Wi-Fi and all the things. So I pay for that personally. And that really, even if I have just like an hour layover, I'll pop in there and get a snack and a, something to drink. And it's a nice little refresher. And I don't have to pay a bunch of money to, to do it in the airport. So I love um, the convenience and the benefit of it. So something to think about if you start traveling on. Anyway, all right. Wow, an hour. Oh, nice. yeah, Probably because I was late. Yeah, right. we like to compare ourselves to time. We do. Okay, well, uh, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas to you all, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Uh, lead powerfully, change the world. Bye. Bye. I'll make sure that you're doing.